Welcome to our uh, fifth week of our survey of the New Testament book of Colossians. We've got one more week to go. I feel like I need to give everybody a bit of a heads up. We are going to skip over a section in Colossians, Colossians 3, uh, verses 1 through 17. That happens to be my very favorite section in all of the New Testament. And we're skipping over it because I love it so much. Now, if that seems weird, it's because I think it deserves a little bit more attention than we can provide in just one week. So later in the year, we're going to come back, and we're going to slow down, and we're going to uh, spend six weeks just on that uh, section alone. So if you love it like I love it, I think you'll be glad that we're patient so that we can give it the attention that it deserves. So what are we going to talk about today? Today we're going to talk about stuff, real life stuff that impacts every single one of us. And as we dive in and dig in, I'm going to ask you to think about how you think about certain things. I'm going to put some concepts on the screen. And when I put these concepts on the screen, all I'm asking is, how do you define it? Family and family roles. What is the definition of a family? Where does it come from? And in your family or in any family, who gets to decide what the family roles are? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? What are gender roles? What is gender? Where does it come from? And how important is it? What does it mean to have privilege? And is it a bad thing? What does it mean to have power? And who should be trusted with it? I thought it would be important for us to talk about this today. After all, what could go wrong with a white guy in a privileged position of leadership talking about this? Now let's put it online while we're at it. Now, It's not my goal to cover all of these things today. We don't have the time for that. And yet, how you think about these things, how you understand them, how you define them, that is gonna be the filter through which you hear and receive today's message. It's an important thing. And throughout this series, every week I've said the same thing. I bet you can say it from memory now. This has been our slogan, be a hard target for deception. When it comes to family and gender and privilege and power, What does it mean to be a hard target for deception? Are you a hard target for deception? And how would you know? As you're kicking that around, I want to ask you one more question. What is the difference between power and authority? A lot of people think that they're the same thing. They're not the same thing. I'm going to use kind of an extreme example to to make my point clear. A kidnapper has the power to take you where you don't want to go. He wouldn't have the authority to take you where you don't want to go. And power is about ability. Authority is about right. So a thief has the ability to take your car. A thief does not have the right to take your car. You and I, we all have the ability to define anything any way that we want to. We could do that. That's not the same thing as having the right to define anything any way that we want to. When it comes to family gender, privilege, and power, who has the right? Who has the authority to say this is the way things ought to be? We're going to take a serious look at some of these things by taking the gospel seriously today. And if you're not a Jesus follower, if you would consider yourself a bit more curious or or skeptical uh, of Jesus, let me just let you in on why so many of us here take what Jesus has to say so seriously. We're convinced that he was not just a really good person. He was more than just a stellar teacher. We're convinced that he actually is God, and ultimately, he is the one who created the universe and everything in it. And if that's true, that means he's the authority. That means he has the right to say the way things ought to be. And so what we're going to read today and what we're going to talk about today is an example of applying, taking his authority seriously. Are you ready? In Colossians chapter 3, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives And do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, 
Obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eyes are on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Can I be honest with you guys this morning? In some ways, maybe in many ways, I would much rather be a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs than to talk about this right now. I don't know if it's possible to talk about this honestly, just kind of in a straightforward, open manner without some people experiencing pain as we go through it. And if you sense hesitancy in me today, it's not because I'm uncomfortable with God's word. It's not because I doubt it. If you sense hesitancy in me, it's not because I'm embarrassed of it. I'm not. I'm convinced that everything that we just read is like a key to unlock greater peace and joy and freedom in our lives. But if you sense hesitancy in me, it's because I've been doing this long enough to know that we're all mixed bags and people bring an assortment of suspicion and regret and confusion and bad experiences. And in our church and in our online audience, there are people whose not-so-distant relatives were slaves. There are people in our church and in our online audience who grew up on the wrong side of segregation and undeniable systemic racism. In our church and in our online audience, there are people who've experienced these verses being abused to justify their abuse. In our church and in our online audience, there are people who identify as LGBTQ and they don't see themselves represented in this, so they wonder, do we see them as second-class humans? And in our church and in our online audience, there are folks who are so burnt out from the politicalization of these topics, they just can't stomach them being talked about anymore. And I'm asking for you to give me enough grace to use this analogy today. If you bring any suspicion or anxiety or hurts related to these topics, those are like landmines. And I don't know where the landmines are for you. So there's a really good chance I'm going to step on one today. And if you sense any hesitancy in me, it's not because I don't want to get hurt. It's because I don't want you to be hurt. I don't want anybody to feel hurt today. I do want us to be uncomfortable. How are we doing with that so far? Okay, a little. Here's, you didn't mishear me. I really do want us to be uncomfortable. And here's why is if there's any broken way of thinking, if there's any untrue way of thinking inside of you, inside of me, I want us to be so uncomfortable inside of the lies that we would sprint to the truth, that we would embrace the truth and love the truth. And I don't, I don't know about you guys, but if I've been duped by my culture, or if I've been duped by my cultural viewpoint, I wanna know. And if I've been blinded by a bad interpretation or a bad application of this passage, I wanna know. And that's really the kind of the disposition that should be true of every person who's a follower of Jesus. That's the kind of thing that we wanna be true of everyone who calls Autumn Ridge Church their home. We have a set of values that we've adopted. We say, this is what we wanna live by. Here's our number one value, the first one. Take truth seriously. We'll follow it wherever it leads. You don't have to be a religious person. You don't have to believe in God. You don't have to follow Jesus for that to be your value. You can adopt that. But if we are followers of Jesus, we really don't have a choice, do we? So what are some facts? What's some truth that'll help us see this with clarity today? I want you to think about this. The gospel doesn't reflect any culture. It challenges every culture. And it's an understandable knee-jerk reaction to simply assume that whatever we read in the New Testament is an expression of the culture of the men who wrote it. I mean, how could it not be? You might be surprised. The only people who can say with a straight face that what we just read is an expression of the culture of the day are people who have no idea about the culture of the day. And throughout this series, we've said that the, the Christians, the Jesus followers in the church in Colossae, who the Apostle Paul is writing to, they lived under enormous pressure. 
There were false teachers who were trying to woo them away from the true gospel. And there was enormous cultural pressure to adopt Roman propaganda, to not simply accept, but to celebrate Roman values and viewpoints. And I want to give you a snapshot of what a Roman household looked like, what it was like to live inside of Roman values and viewpoints. So this is a typical Roman household. Fathers were the head of the house, and everyone was subordinate to him. All subordinates were essentially property. Fathers had the power over life and death of those in his home. Fathers had the legal authority to kill infant children without the consent of his wife. Fathers arranged marriages for their children. Fathers had the ability to force their adult children to divorce. Both men and women could legally opt for divorce, but the laws always favored men financially. Because just about every marriage was arranged, it was common and permissible for a man to have an affair, as many affairs as he wanted. It was never allowed, never accessible, never acceptable for a woman to have, a married woman to have an affair. Men were allowed to physically abuse their wives and their slaves. There is nothing in the New Testament that supports that, that expresses that, that endorses that. And now, with this as the backdrop into which the Apostle Paul is writing these instructions, I want us to listen again, to see again what he wrote. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Into a world and into a society where men had the power and the legal authority to abuse their wives, the Apostle Paul said, you gotta be gentle into a world and into a society when men had the power and the legal authority to control the every aspect of everyone's lives and their household and they could even kill their children the apostle paul said you can't even discourage them you can't you can't embitter them to which your typical roman guy would have said where are you getting this and the apostle paul he wrote he said husbands love your wives And this word love, it comes from the Greek word agape. That's God kind of love. It's unconditional, sacrificial love. It's the love to describe, it's the word, it's the kind of love that describes the way Jesus loves us. And the Apostle Paul says, guys, you cannot be a tyrant. You're a servant. Guys, you cannot be harsh with your wives. Not in any way. You can't be harsh with them physically, uh, verbally, sexually, emotionally. Not in any way whatsoever. And into this world in which the paterfamilias, the head of the household, the man, had all kinds of advantages, Apostle Paul said, you cannot use your advantageous position to advance your agenda or to advance your desires at the expense of anyone in your household. And other places, when the Apostle Paul gave instructions for what family life should look like, he said, men, love and serve your wives in the same way that Jesus loved and served the church and gave his life up for her. Peter, who was a close follower of Jesus, a friend of Jesus, an eyewitness to Jesus' life, to his crucifixion, to his resurrection, he would be a leader in the church in the first century. He'd write two books in the New Testament. Peter went so far as to say this, guys, God is not even going to listen to our prayers if we are not considerate, gentle, and loving servants of our wives. That's pretty serious. And so these instructions that we just read that might make some people wince today, they were irresistibly attractive to women and children and slaves. And we shouldn't be surprised to learn that it disrupted the uh, power structures in Rome and and, and people, the power brokers in Roman society, they reacted hostily to this way of thinking. I don't know if you've ever heard of this man, Plutarch, In the first century, he was a philosopher, a biographer, and a historian. No friend to Christianity whatsoever. Ladies, I want you to listen to what he had to say. You're going to love it. A wife ought not to make friends of her own, but to enjoy her husband's friends in common with him. Ladies, settle down. All right, you don't need your own life. You don't need your own social circle. Your husband's friends are good enough for you. The gods are the first and foremost important friends. You know, you don't even need your husband's friends. Just the gods. They're fine. 
Wherefore it is unbecoming, uh, excuse me, wherefore it is becoming for a wife to worship and to know only the gods that her husband believe in. Ladies, you don't get to pick what you believe. Your husband gets to pick what you believe. And listen to what he says next. Shut the front door tight upon queer rituals and outlandish superstitions, for with no God do stealthy and secret rites performed uh, by a woman find any favor. What do you think he's talking about? You know what I think he's talking about? I think he's talking about Christianity. I think you can hear the anxiety in his voice. We need to get our women under control because Christianity is messing with what we got going on here. And to really feel the force and the weight of what the Apostle Paul is saying. I think it's to our benefit to read something else that he wrote uh, to a different church in the city of Philippi. In Philippians chapter two, we read this. The Apostle Paul writes, in your relationships, which ones? All of them. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And what I want us to do is I want us to use this passage and connect it to the other passage that we were reading and let it be a framework through which we develop a little bit more gospel fluency. And this is gospel fluency. It's when we know what the gospel is, we understand the implications of the gospel, and then we can apply gospel motivation. So part of knowing the gospel is recognizing that Jesus humbly gave up his advantages and privileges and humbly chose to serve and save you and me. An implication of the gospel is this, is that if I'm a follower of Jesus, I may be most like Jesus when I give up my privileges and advantages and use them to serve the good of somebody else. And gospel motivation is, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for what Jesus has done for me. I am happy to love and serve other people in the exact same way. There's a village in Vietnam where most of the people were, were not followers of Jesus, and there's a handful of men who had become uh, Jesus followers. And so they were getting together, and they happened to be studying the same passage that we're reading today about husbands love your wives. And, and like all the other men and, and their village, they had arranged marriages, and they just kind of got honest with each other, and they said, I don't even like my wife. <laughs> the other guy said, I don't like my wife either. They're grumpy and mean. I said, well, how are we gonna do this? How are we going to take this seriously? How are we going to apply this, this passage to our marriages? And they kind of looked around and they, they said, well, you know, our wives get up, like all the other wives in the village, they get up well before dawn and they start collecting firewood and cooking meals and doing all kinds of stuff. And all the men, we all just sleep in till nine o'clock and drink tea when we get up. They said, what if, what if we decided to let our wives sleep in and we get up early and do the chores? Now, this is a dangerous illustration to use because my wife is here today. <laughs> and so they, they said, okay, this is what we're, we're gonna do that. We're gonna try it, but don't tell anybody because they don't know what kind of blowback or retribution they're gonna get from the other men in the village if the other men find out what they're doing. And so a couple of weeks go by, the wives are getting more rest. The wives feel appreciated by their husbands. The wives start being more affectionate with their husbands. They really start liking each other. Here's the problem. Everybody else in the village noticed. And they got jealous. And they started gossiping. And they started getting upset. And, and, they, and it created such a stir that the, that the village elder called a meeting to find out what's going on here. And the village elder called these men up in front of the other men and they said, what's going on? What has changed in your marriages? Why are they so different from ours? And these guys, they don't know what's gonna happen. They don't know if they're gonna get punished for this. So they cautiously and sheepishly just said, we've been getting up early and doing the chores and letting our wives sleep in. And the village elder said, that's it. From now on, all the men get up and the wives get to sleep in. That's the power of the gospel. I want you to think about this. The gospel doesn't give our privileges protection. It gives them purpose. Do for others what Jesus has done for you. 
Today, we're talking about privilege. We're talking about power. We're talking about advantages. And I know that this makes some of us uncomfortable because there are people who love to use these terms and they use them in a way from a political ideology that makes many of us uncomfortable. But having power and privileges and advantages in life, they're not a bad thing. I have them and I'm grateful for the ones that I have. And if you have power and advantages and privileges in life, and you probably do, Jesus does not want us to feel guilty about that. I think he wants us to feel responsible. I think that Jesus wants us to be fantastic, gospel-motivated managers of whatever privileges and advantages and power we have in life so that we can use them to serve his glory and the good of other people. And as you think about that, think about that as we read what Paul wrote to slave owners. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know you also have a master in heaven. If your moral compass is always set to doing what is right and fair, if your moral compass is always set to do for your slaves, do for everyone else what Jesus has done for you, how long do you think you can go on justifying keeping them slaves? It's important to note that in the Roman world, slavery was much different than the chattel slavery of the American South. It was more like indentured servitude. I'm not saying it was great. I'm just saying you cannot equate the two. In the Roman world, slavery was almost always based on economic status, sometimes on the outcome of a war. In the Roman world, slavery was not at all based on ethnicity or race. There were Europeans who owned Africans. There were Africans who owned Europeans. In the Roman world, slavery was almost never permanent. Sometimes slaves liked the status and the home that they lived in so much that they voluntarily became lifelong slaves. But just about anyone who was a slave got their freedom by the time they were 30 years old. Slaves could own property, could own businesses, and could own other slaves. Now, I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying we can't see it through the lens through which we see our own American history. But we gotta be honest about our history. And here's why. Because there are way too many Jesus followers. More problematic, there were way too many pastors who abused this passage to justify the abuse of people and the enslavement of people. And that was wrong. Now, there was no excuse for that. And into this very different kind of situation, addressing legally sanctioned and protected slavery, the Apostle Paul connected the way that Jesus loves and treats us to the way that we love and treat all others. And he did not explicitly condemn slavery, but he made it so uncomfortable that there was no way it could continue. If you've never read the New Testament book of Philemon, you should read it. It's not a book, really, it's a letter. And uh, if you go home and read it today, I pr- it'll take less than five minutes. It's very short. Philemon was a member of this church. Philemon was, was a part of the church at Colossae. And Philemon had a runaway slave, and his runaway slave's name was Onesimus. And Onesimus, after he ran away, somehow he got connected with Paul. I don't know how that happened, but because of Paul's influence, Onesimus decided to become a follower of Jesus. And so Onesimus went with a delegation from Paul back to Colossae to deliver this letter of Colossians to them and also deliver a letter to Philemon. And the letter that Paul wrote to Philemon was very likely read out loud to Philemon in front of the whole church. And in that letter, the apostle Paul basically said, you gotta treat Onesimus like a brother in Christ. You gotta forgive him, you gotta let him go. The apostle Paul essentially said to Philemon, Rome gives you the power to punish him. But Jesus has given you a heart to forgive him and to free him. Paul did not have the power to end slavery in the Roman world. He did have the authority to apply the gospel in such a way that Christians would demand that it end, that Christians would, would, would cry out for the abolition of slavery. And if you're thinking, okay, Rick, you've given me some help to see this with greater clarity, But why did Paul say wives submit and slaves obey? If that feels contradictory, I want to give you something to think about. Consider this. This is not instructions on what a Roman household should look like. 
It's instructions on what you should look like if you lived in a Roman household. This is not Paul coming and saying, this is how God said to set up your houses, but this is how to apply the gospel in this particular situation, in any situation you would find yourself in. And just imagine, imagine the the kind of questions that people in the church of Colossae would have been asking. Wives would have been asking these kinds of questions. If my husband is not a believer, if my husband doesn't follow Jesus and he's being abusive with me and he doesn't want me to come to church, what should I do? How do I live out the gospel? And if you're a slave and you're trying to follow Jesus, but you have a master who doesn't follow Jesus, what do you do? And then what do you do if your master wants to start coming to church and becomes a follower of Jesus? And so the apostle Paul wrote what he wrote to raise the level of gospel fluency for wives, for children, and slaves. And this is what he wrote. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Ladies, it's primarily about you and your relationship with Jesus. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord's kids. It's primarily about you and Jesus. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, their favor, but with sincerity of heart out of reverence for the Lord because it's primarily about you and Jesus. And whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs and there is no favoritism. Let me ask you this question. What do you do when you recognize an injustice? Or what do you do when you recognize that something's broken and it's not the way that it ought to be? In a relationship, in in an institution, in a system? And what do you do when you find yourself in it and at the bottom of it? Following Jesus, living out the gospel means loving all others the way that Jesus has loved you from whatever position you are in. So I want us to think about this. The gospel doesn't endorse subjugation. It empowers submission, servanthood, and suffering well. And I I don't have enough time left to really dive into what this word means, submission and how it plays out in relationships. But I got good news. The week after Easter, we're kicking off a brand new relationship series. It's called Conquest. And we're gonna talk about marriage. We're gonna talk about what if I married the wrong person? We're gonna talk about singleness. We're gonna talk about sex. We're gonna talk about divorce. It's a message series for everybody. I think it's gonna be good. And in the first week, we're gonna slow down and hunker down and really talk about what this means and why it is so good for relationships. So just be patient with me and come back for that. But today, let me share this. And this is for everybody, for men and women. Whatever your response is, whatever your reaction is to the concept of submission, servanthood, and suffering, could we pause long enough to see that those are three terms that describe Jesus and the way that he has loved us and the way that he continues to love us. And if there is joy for Jesus in submission and serving and suffering, maybe, just maybe, there is joy for us in it as well as we follow him in those ways. So this is my invitation to you. This is what I'm suggesting that we do today. That from wherever we're at, whatever level of advantages or disadvantages or whatever we have, that from that place, we would seek to love and serve others in the same way that Jesus has loved and served us. And that in relationships and institutions and systems, whether you're at the bottom or the top or somewhere in between, that we would recognize that this is the attitude that the gospel produces in us. It's my privilege to use my position to advance your position because that's what Jesus did for us. It's my privilege to use my position to advance your position. And if you're not ready to follow Jesus yet, if you would say you're more curious or or skeptical and you are drawn to the idea that those with power should use it to help those who don't have it, that those with advantages and privileges should use them to help those who don't have them, if you're drawn to that, could you widen your gaze just enough to see that you're actually drawn to Jesus? Because these things did not become common until the gospel became 
common. And if you find yourself following along with this and thinking, I like this, would you be willing to go all the way and to follow Jesus because he is the one from whom these values come? And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, would we be willing to look at how far this can take us? Just like we experience change, we experience transformation from the inside out personally in relationships and systems and institutions, transformation can take place from the inside out. And just like Jesus moved towards the messes in our life, would we be willing to move towards the messes that we see in the world and take the gospel with us? So if you see things that aren't the way that they ought to be in the legal system, go be the best lawyer, go be the best cop, go be the best judge you can be and let the gospel work from the inside out. If you see things that aren't the way they ought to be in politics, go be the best city council person, go be the best senator or governor or president or whatever you can be and let the gospel work from the inside out. If you see things in the healthcare system that you don't think that they're the way they ought to be, go be the best doctor or nurse or PA, administrator, researcher that you can be and let the gospel work from the inside out. If there are things in the education system you think should be better, go be the best principal, teacher, teacher's aide, volunteer, parent, whatever that you can be. And let the gospel work from the inside out. In your home, in your apartment building, in, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your relationships, would you be willing to say, you know what, it is my joy, it is my privilege to serve and to love others the way Jesus has loved and served me. What would happen? What could happen if we all resolved it's my privilege to use my position to advance your position? Will you pray with me?